still a problem. Sorry? Yes, Tanzuma. Yes, the computer made the work. Oh, computer, not my computer. I don't, I hope not. <laughs> okay. So I can also use it in the. Um, Ma'am, can you put in the slide mode? Slide. Yes. Mode. It's fine. Uh, yeah, perfect. 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 Oh, somebody listening was yes. Okay. They didn't have that their computer mute. So so I've been also interested in the individual medicinal properties of individual plants, for example, molecular medicine from plants. So um, in this particular talk, I was asked to focus on what I know about uh, British documents, European documents on Indian medicine. And this is, of course, a vast subject. And so I'm going to just give you an overview of the number of books that I'm familiar with that document Indian um, botanical and medical knowledge, um, not only for medicinal purposes in use in India, but also for commercial purposes, as well as, of course, later for agricultural and horticultural purposes. Because Indian resources, as you will see later on in my talk, were, of course, unique in many, many ways. And so uh, the initial purpose for the Europeans to come to India in the first place was to, uh, to accumulate and access the, the unique resources of India. So we are going to, so I'm going to just uh, put through a few slides initially, just to see, to talk to you about the reasons why, you, you know, about the early trade uh, that was happening between India and Europe, India, India and the, and the uh, Middle East and beyond. And this is, of course, the, talk, the motivation in the long run for the, for the Europeans to finally come to India at the end of the 15th century. Because these might be materials that were being accumulated from India had been passing through the Middle East and then from there to Europe. But at some point, for example, at the end of the 16th century, the no, sorry, 15th century, the Portuguese decide to directly come to India, and that's the beginning of the for the colonial enterprise. But so let me first give you a little historical um, a, a historical background on uh, for the European assimil uh, assimilation uh, of indigenous knowledge, namely why the purpose, why we, why they came and what they faced when they came to India. Of course, here, this slide is actually quite interesting for me because there are two parts to the slide. On the left is a very important map. It is a, it's a map of uh, by uh, the historian, you know, based on a historical document from the first century called the Periplus of the European Sea. The Periplus of the European Sea was supposedly, supposedly is the a travel document of a mariner from the first century AD. So he talks about training Boroba, Vartan, and Garrity, and all because they're not. So he was actually documenting the actual um, uh, route of travel and the commodities that were being taken in ships that were leaving India and. For example, in the first part of, of the early part of the first millennium. So this book, you know, talk, so this map is actually based, this map by Abraham Ortelius from the 16th century is actually based on a document from the first century. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the, this, it, you can see that the map places peninsular India at the center of the map. So this was actually, India was the center of international trade in the first millennium. And the, the quote on the right from um, Sloma Gorchian, who is an, um, a scholar of, of uh, India trade and of, between India and the Middle East, uh, a very distinguished British scholar, says that India trade was the backbone of the international economy in the Middle Ages, and medicinal substances were you know, supremely important commodities. So, when the value of medicinal substances in India were known all over the world from the beginning of the first century. And what is really very interesting to realize that science as we think about now is supposed to be a Western development. Whereas experimentation or by trial and error in discovering the properties of the um, plants, uh, minerals, and other materials, but actually going on all over the world. 
So experimentation is not necessarily confined to the laboratory. And certainly India has one of the most highly defined uh, knowledge systems in those terms. So the other interesting fact is that you really need to think about how you define science. So this is another uh, subject that I'm actually very interested in, but we won't go into it at this point. But anyway, but additional, so my work so far mostly has been focused on this early part of what I talked about, early India trade, and also the interaction between uh, you know, East and West uh, during the early colonial period. And if you are, uh, here we are. so if you're interested to find out something more about what I have done in the past, I would like to um, invite you to look at, uh, I'm not pointing it in the right direction, oh, here we are. So if you're interested to hear and to find out more about the work I've done, uh, on the early colonial enterprise and also on documentation of Indian traditional knowledge by Europeans. You're welcome to photograph this slide and look at uh, and in detail at those. Both of these documents are available online. The first is a publication that resulted from an exhibition that I did uh, at the NCBS um, in 2008 when I was a visiting scholar at the NCBS. And the second is an online exhibition called Google Cultural Institute, which I was invited to do, which actually even goes further into the period you know, beyond the Portuguese and Dutch um, you know, um, interaction with India. It actually goes into the influences of India, not only in, in botanical medical um, you know, knowledge systems, but also into art and culture, which you might find interesting. In fact, if you go uh, to, to look at Milton, for example, in Shakespeare. It's interesting to see Milton, for example, talks about the ficus leaf, and that he says that the ficus leaf where Adam and Eve sinned was not the kind that is in, uh, you know, in Europe, but it's the kind that you find in Malabar and Dakar. So it's really interesting to look at the influences of Indian knowledge system in the larger context. And that's been one of my main interests. And the second, the Google Cultural Institute exhibition actually goes into this in detail about the broader influence of Indian knowledge systems in many different levels globally. So let's get back to the, to the question at hand, which is the European documents, and especially the British documents on Indian medicine. And of course, the primary reason for documenting indigenous knowledge systems, so Indian knowledge systems in botany and medicine, uh, especially had to do with property diseases that they encountered when they came to India. And in the words of John Hugen van Linschotten, who was a Dutch resident in the Portuguese colony in Goa in the latter part of the 16th century, he describes the plight of the Europeans in India. And in this case, it happens to be in Goa. He says that they have continual fevers. They have many continual fevers, which are burning agues and consume men's bodies with extreme heat, whereby within four or five days, uh, they are either dead or poor, because they have been seized. But this sickness is common and very dangerous, and has no remedy for the potentialis, but letting of blood. Because bleeding was a very important therapeutic method in those days. But, but the Indians and the heathens do cure themselves with herbs. So this was a very important you know, observation by the by the Portuguese, and of course they go on to describe. He then um, he goes on to describe. Uh, but here I'm skipping ahead to the British um, colonization in India. We will go back very shortly. But shortly after the at the beginning of the um, British enterprise in India, which starts in 1600 by Queen Elizabeth I giving the charter to the British East India Company for the exclusive purpose of trading with India, they established several colonies in, in, uh, in India. They are actually just um, shown there. I'm sorry that it's not uh, clearer. There were colonies actually established in Fort St. George, Madras, or near what is now Chennai. There were also colonies in Bengal and also in Sudan. And but the one of the largest colonies of the British in India were actually in Port St. George. And um, later on, I'll show you another map 
it shows that the British, the British settlement in in uh, Port St. George was flourishing by the middle of the uh, of the 1600s. But the major problem that they encountered in in um, Port St. George was, but besides the competition, of course, from the Dutch and the Portuguese, was of course disease. So as hospitals were established in um, in in uh, the British colonies, and the very first hospitals were actually in Port St. George. And of course, the motivation for the British coming to India is actually written there, which you can see. It says that you know India has such unique you know, uh, materials to supply. I don't know if you can read it. it. Says, but Europe has tasted this luxury, which is the luxury of Indian quantities of them. And since, and since the custom of a hundred years, because the Portuguese were already taking Indian materials, so this is already 1600s, Portuguese came in 1800s. So their spices are necessary to constitution of all degrees of people. And then our own plantations and for Spaniards and the Americans. So this is an interesting thing to notice because Indian commodities, especially medicines, were being taken from India to other tropical colonies by the Portuguese and by the Dutch. And because, because as I said earlier, India had a highly developed botanical medical knowledge that other colony, colonial areas did not have. So colonial, so then the statement goes on to say, it can never be advisable for England to quit this trade and leave it to any other nation. So part of the motivation for the British coming to India was, of course, you know, the competition between the European nations. So anyway, skipping that that was just to uh, give you a you know better background of why they were in the in. Okay, so this is a detail of a map of course in Georgia. and you can if you. Are able to get a close look at it, you can see that Port St. George at the time was occupied by not only the British but also traders from all different parts of the world because it was, you know, Indian commodities were so highly desirable. But again, the, the, uh, the disease issue is something that they had to deal with. And so by 1664, the first hospital, British hospital, was established in Port St. George, followed by one in in one in 17. And British physicians and surgeons were sent from England to take care of the troops as well as the residents of their residents in, in Port St. George. So they set about to, to learn indigenous medical information from physicians, from, from, from uh, traditional practitioners and healers. And this, so the information was then shared between the different um, um, medical facilities in various parts of India that belong to the British. So some of the documentation that I'm going to be talking about are um, were actually collected and documented for use of people from other parts, other parts of India, other British uh, settlements in other parts of India. But it, it is also interesting to know that one of the earliest settlements uh, was, of course, in Port St. George, and some of the earliest publications uh, or botanical medical knowledge that the British did were documented in uh, from Fort St. George. You may say that this has to do with the high biodiversity of the of the region, where many, many medicinal plants were available, and there was also very very uh, highly sophisticated traditional medical knowledge systems of all different levels in, in that part of the, in that part of India. So. Uh, in the words of, uh, of uh, Adrian Van Wee Dackenstein, who was the who was the person who assembled the famous Hortus uh, Malabaricus documents, he describes the condition of the of health and scholarship in medicine in India. In, and this is almost contemporary with some of the British documents that I'm going to be talking about. He says that talking about the people of Malabar in this case, he says they usually live to a great age. And their health is cured by native physicians who do not request medical needs from other people. Since they are content with only those medicaments, their region supply bound a custom which is imitated by the Europeans. So this is the beginning of the acknowledgement of the necessity of indigenous medicine, medical knowledge. So then here 
Um, I don't know if you can see the fine text on the on the image, but this is a document that shows the number of um, books that were published in the 16th and 17th centuries by the by Europeans in India that document Indian medical knowledge. And along with this, if you could get up close to it, I apologize for. Uh, you could also see, along with the major events in history of the country, for example, when Garcia Orta was writing his first book on Indian medical knowledge by a European, it was in the time of Akbar. And this Garcia Orta's book was the first printed book done in India. It was done in Portuguese for the use of the Portuguese living in India because if they were dependent upon Indian medicine, the Portuguese physicians needed to use Indian medicines. And therefore, the knowledge documented by the Portuguese were written by Garcia Orta, who was a physician himself, made available to other Portuguese physicians. Interestingly, shortly after Portuguese, Garcia Orta's work was published, it was taken to Europe, and it was translated into all European languages. Because all the Italian, the French, and the Dutch, all of these people who are also establishing colonies in other parts of the world, use Garcia Orta's book as a basis for finding you know, suitable therapies of related plants in other parts of the province. So anyway, this goes on to talk about a number of works, but I also want to point out that there are two publications there, which are not entirely just medicinal, uh, books for medicinal property, but they were also very important texts of the period on, botan on uh, botanical knowledge. For example, the book by Carol, Carol Clusius on Exoticorum Legalism goes on and on. It was a book, book published in 1605 in, in Antwerp. In, um, and it is one of the first studies of tropical botany. Because the discovery of tropical botany extended you know, the study of, of systematic botany. And so Clusius's work incorporates Garcia Orta's and also Acosta's work, because Acosta was a, also a Portuguese physician who wrote a book called Tratado de Drogas, Medicines, whatever, of India. But that book was written in, in Spanish and was published in Spain, in Burgos, because Indian medicines were being imported to Europe. And that book is particularly was written for Spanish physicians and and, um, and apothecaries and pharmacists using Indian medicines in Europe. So I just want to give you a, a sort of a background of, you know, of how the, of the, of the dispersal of Indian medical information in throughout the world. And now I'm talking about Western world because we talked about the fact that I haven't really looked at, at, the, at, the, dis, um, at the dispersion of Indian knowledge in the East. Because in, in many ways, I find that you know China has a very strong medical system and so on and so on. And most of the colonial enterprise in, in India was of course European. And that is in my primary interest. So anyway, this just gives you an idea about the number of works that document Indian, Indian medical knowledge that done by European. And of course, we have been coming to the British documents here that they are going to come. So I just want to give you a glimpse of some of these books. And the other important part about some of these books, for example, the images that you see there are from the Hortus Indicus Malavaratus, and I know you've heard enough about it, so I don't need to introduce you to it. But what is interesting is that many of these documents were also European documents on Indian medicine, but not only really important as medical texts, but also as texts of, of botany. Because these are the first accurate botanical drawings that were made that were made of Indian plants that were available in Europe. So, in addition to the medical knowledge, these volumes also contributed greatly to the study of systematic botany. In fact, um, you know, um, Linnaeus, who uh, did the first botanical classification, relies actually on Indian botanical books published of Indian botany. As one of his major sources, uh, especially in the Hortus Malarcus, actually. So finally, we are going to. Uh, so one question: the elephant in the room here is who are the people who supply the knowledge to the Europeans? And in many cases, except in the case of the Hortus Malarcus, the indigenous sources are unacknowledged. 
And you will see when I give you uh, the names of the British books, the books are always published at the name of the British person or the, or the person who assimilated or who collected the knowledge. The individuals from whom they learned, learned who contributed the knowledge, who provided the medicines, who identified the plants, who collected them are never alive. So this is a very interesting other point that we just talked about. There is a very important document called the Bauer Manuscript, which is one of the earliest manuscripts on Indian medicine. It's actually a 50 lead um, birch bark manuscript, which is now in the collection of the Bodleian Library at Oxford. And I knew such a document existed, but I wasn't able to find it because I did not know how to search the Bodleian Library for the document because it, there was no name that I could associate with it because then it is named the Bauer Manuscript. Because Bauer was the person who happened to purchase the manuscript from a, a, a person who discovered the manuscript under a Buddhist duva in Kucha in Central Asia. And so the manuscript was named for Bauer, not for the... But he, on, in the meantime, I don't want, I don't want to diverge from the topic at hand, but I just want to show you some of the anomalies of this, this, this type of material, because it is known in the, in the text, the power manuscript actually um, list, names the author of the manuscript. It was an Indian Buddhist monk uh, whose name was Yosamitra, but the manuscript is known as power manuscript. This is just another aside. Anyway, let's get back to the business of getting, talking at the British documents here. And so what, why, why interests me about European documents on Indian, on Indian traditional medicine? There are a number of reasons why I, as an experimental scientist, uh, interest, uh, who studied molecular biology and so on, is particularly interested in, in, these, in these documents. Because um, in addition to the fact that these are actually mostly dot knowledge, medical knowledge, uh, collected from local healers and, and warriors of the region, not from um, you know, scholar physicians. Because in many cases, for example, in Garcia Orta's work, he specifically um, states that the scholar physicians actually disdained them and did not want to work with them. So most of the knowledge came from folk physicians. And so that is an important reason why this, these documents are, are valuable in this 21st century. Secondly, the, yeah, and most of the plants included in these texts are not actually part of the classical medical texts. Because these are mostly regional medicine plants. And they, the other uh, part that is very important for uh, certain types of work that I'm interested in, that I have highlighted, these books, all the European texts, actually list medicinal properties of single plants. And they are not complex formulations as in the classical text. Next, the identities and medicinal properties of these plants in this European text are often cross referenced with plants from other tropical regions. Because the British were also, for example, the British East India Company was actually collecting medicinal plants also from other colonies like in East Asia. So there are cross references which makes identity of these plants. Many of the, many of the names are actually local names. But on the other hand, because of the fact that you also refer to you know, plants from other regions of the province, it makes the identification of these plants in modern scientific nomenclature much easier. And um, the other, lastly, these medicines were documented by the British in their collections and passed you know, from one part of the British colony to the other is because they were convinced that these medicines are, they are, are effective. Therefore, in some sense, there is validation for the efficacy of these medicines. Okay? So that is, of course, you know, questionable because validation, what does that mean in those days? But, the, but because the medicine information was collected, and passed from physicians, to, you know, from different parts, British physicians from in different parts of India and also in other parts of the world. They only documented those materials that they found. All right. So I just want you to see how some of the descriptions of these plants are given in these steps. Oops. 
So I'm taking an example from not from a British document, from an earlier work by Garcia Water. And I just want you to see how simple the description of the medicinal property of the plant is. Now, this is something that all of us probably know of this plant. In Malayalam, we call it you know, terribul, you know, and, uh, which is used for you know preparation of fish, for example. But the middle so uh, you know, so he Garcia Water reports the medicinal property in a very specific way. He says this fruit is very much in use by midwives who give it to women who have just given birth to expel the placenta and to produce milk and before labor to ease the process which, which they say it has great effect. So starting immediately, proceeding immediately forward, you can imagine that it probably has certain ingredients that may have very specific properties for relaxing the muscles, or you know, you can think about it effect perhaps on the muscle. So there is there are hints here which are very, very important and very interesting. <laughs> So anyway, this, uh, this is the kind of documentation that you see. They're very simple, easy to understand the descriptions of properties in most of these books. Okay. <laughs> okay. This, uh, so now I, finally we are going to get to uh, some European, some British documents. And so a little bit of information about the East India Company itself. East India, um, East India Company's principal settlement uh, in the uh, in the middle of the 17th century was actually in Fort St. George. And this is just an image uh, that I got from Yale University Museum of British Art uh, about the um, about the just an image of the of the in the region showing the, some of their um, establishments and factories in the back and so on. And so company restrictions were, of course, you know, uh, were established in 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 these different hospitals, and they had a wide range of sources to collect information about medicinal plants. That included local healers, and of course, some scholar physicians did uh, come you know, interact with them. But importantly, there were also traders who were involved in you know Indian traders. In fact. In some of the Portuguese documents, actually, it's very interesting because they had names of individual Indian uh, uh, traders who were supplying the medicines. And it's, some of the Portuguese documents, which is not a subject today, actually shows how many how many tallas of uh, this particular medicine and so and so supplied, and how much money was given to them. So many some of the suppliers were actually uh, traders. If who knew the values of medicinal plants, and therefore was supplying them to uh, some, in this case, the British. And then, of course, you know, for exporters, but also people who are exporting materials to other parts of Europe, but also supplying these, these uh, physicians. And East India Company had, by this time, uh, so East India Company had by this time commissioned British physicians in all of their colonial hospitals to collect information on medicine plants and their uses and convey them to their their to England to the set of the group for them to disperse to other parts of the world. And one of the earliest such um, documents that were collected by the British East India Company actually came from Fort St. George Madras. And there were a series of eight papers, and this is what I want to start with. A series of eight papers, which were published in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, starting in 1701 to 1702, which was published by uh, a a member of the Royal Society called uh, James Pettiver. He was an apothecary as well as a botanist. So these papers, why is that image of that thing on the top? Anyway, there were eight papers published and they were um, starting in 1701. And so this is the first type of the title of the first one. The first book of East India plants with their names, virtues, descriptions, 
and some additional remarks by James Petiver, a Portuguese and fellow of the Royal Society. And so underneath it says, these plants were gathered from February the 26th to the 28th okay, at a specific place and about 20 miles from Port St. George. This is very interesting because we know the time and the location where we're taking. Now, this, this, so, uh, okay. So in the meantime, what happened, of course, was that British East India Company, as I said earlier, was actually commissioning all other physicians to collect material and send it to the East India Company office in London. And these informations were then dispersed among the scholars and naturalists in, in England for study of bot botany as well as for understanding and assembling the medical information. So James Petiver, who was the fellow of the Royal Society, gets access to this material sent by, um, by Samuel Brown. So let's look at some information about who Samuel Brown himself was. What's going on? Ah. So the collector in this case is documented to be Samuel Brown. Samuel Brown was the principal surgeon in Madras since 1697. Over a period of 17 years, he collected over 300 medicine plants used by Indian physicians around Fort St. George. As I said earlier, Indian sources are unknown, but these plants were um, selected obviously because Brown in his experience and those of other physicians in his knowledge found these plants to be effective for whatever diseases they were being used for. And Brown was also commissioned by the East India Company not only to send the information about the medicine plants, but to send plant specimens and seeds and plant cuttings, also preserved herbarium sheets for the Royal Society to distribute for study. And the, on the left is a um, plant specimen that was sent by Brown to the East India Company which is now the collection of the National wow. Museum in London. And so Brown on, states that his motivation for engaging in this activity is for improving natural knowledge and for use and improvement that, and for maybe made of such collections have ordered that public shall have benefit of this present. His English is a little bit complicated, or, but because it's sort of order English, right? But basically, he is doing it partly because he thinks that it has a great, you know, value for the for the benefit of the public. So this was sent as a gift to the British India Company, and from there, the British India Company then engages scholars such as um, James Pettiver to analyze and comment on this material. And so these papers that. Um, are of great value because uh, as a scholar, Petula then interprets this material. And so, sorry, then that. So, so the scholar in this, in, in this case is James Petula, who is a fellow of the Royal Society, a portrait and a prominent naturalist in London. And who is that collaboration? and the exchange of correspondence with certain, with certain Samuel Brown, he created an important earliest early collection of, of early British collection of Indian medicine plants and information about their uses. And these eight papers were published in the philosophical transactions in the Royal Society, with annotations actually from other European texts. So they are actually very interesting scholarly work for study of individual medicine plants. And as I said earlier, many of them were, of course, uh, folk medicines, which have since been, you know, not the information is not available. Else. And if anybody wants to learn more about it, I've given you a citation at the bottom by Alice Marples, and this paper is published in 2020. So please feel free to uh, use the information for further study if you want. Okay, now we are going to look at uh, a page from the one of the Royal Society publications on the left. Um, uh, it's actually interestingly, all these eight papers are available online. 
uh, because um, you can go to philosophical transactions to the Royal Society and find these papers. So let's look at, see, so information goes from Samuel Brown to James Pettiver. James Pettiver then interprets this material, looks at it from various points of view, scientific perspectives that are available at the period, and then publishes it in the Royal Society for access and study by physicians and scholars all around the world. Okay. So what does Samuel Brown provide? He provides place and date of collection, local name of the plant, description of the plant, medicinal properties. So in this case, we are looking at the property of one single plant and here says cures coughs, ulcers of the lungs, consumption of fevers. Then he goes on to describe the part of the plant used. Then he says the method of preparation. Native use it oil and butter. So, um, and then James Pettiver, on the other hand, takes the information that, um, that uh, um, Samuel Brown has supplied and interprets it in his own way. And he looks at the local name and he then looks for corresponding names in other publications. Okay. And he refers here to the, uh, a plant in the hot small barracks in volume 5, 371. Uh, and also with another publication that has to do with Asian plants, which is John Reese Victoria Plantar. So in this way, we have the validation of the plant that is being used from multiple perspectives because of the fact that there were no, you know, binomial nomenclature. Some of these names are sometimes shifty, but by having this uh, kind of comparison, we can identify this plant. So next is description of a specific of the plant. Uh, and in, so James Pettiberg, in terms of, had just reviewed the first three volumes of the Hortus Malbarcus. So Pettiberg's intention actually was to work with um, Samuel Brown to put together something akin to the Hortus Malbarcus. So he refers here to the Hortus Malbarcus in the book up on the top. And it, it talks, talks about the fact that, uh, so the, the resorption takes away swelling, abates sharpness of urine, pieces of the stone, and so on and so forth. So basically one gets the feeling that it must have diuretic properties. Okay. Okay. So in reading this text, one is able to, uh, you know, give, to interpret in modern terms, some of the properties that this plant may have. But then what I did was that I went to the Hortus Malabaricus, which he refers this plant as being related. So I looked up the image of the Hortus Malabaricus, image of the plant in the Hortus Malabaricus, and there you have it. And the plant in the Hortus Malabaricus is called Cadillary. So then I looked at the property of a Cadillary in the Hortus Malabaricus. Interestingly, um, uh, Manila's translation of the Hortus Malabaricus, which of course makes this information accessible to us because it's no longer in Latin. And of course, there's a picture of, Malab uh, of um, Professor Manila. The English translation says that Kadaledi decoction removes swelling and dysuria and removes pain of the stone. Okay? And it also is, uh, it also is uh, extracted with butter. So in many ways, the properties relate. It, it, and break stones of the bladder. So you see some of the same properties up here. So there is validation by cross weapons. So that is one of the other important properties of these European documents, because they can be cross weapons to validate some of what is being you know, written, what is being recorded. So from a perspective, from my perspective, this is an important um, property of these type of, of this material. But anyway, um, leaving this behind and jumping forward to other British documents of the period, you can see that a large number of British documents were actually published in up into the um, into the early part of the 20th century. And they cover all manner of um, subjects, including horticulture and uh, you know, general information about plant flora, British India, and so on. Um, large numbers of works were published because India was also the source of not only medicines, but cotton and various rare woods and many, many other products. 
And so many of uh, all of these books, there, this vast number of books, and this is just a, a selection that, that just shows you, again, as I said, all of these books are, of course, published under the name of the book authors in the collections. Okay? So there are three books that I want to just give you a brief introduction before I start. This is going to be particularly interesting to all of you here. One of them, this is the first one, a catalog of Indian medicine plants and drugs with their names in Hindustani and, the, and Sanskrit languages. And it says, intended chiefly for the use of gentlemen of the medical profession on their first arrival in India, to whom it must be desirable to know what articles of material America this country affords, and by what name they may that they may find them. And of course, this is the front page of the of the book. But it is especially John Fleming was a physician scholar and was actually very um, um, very involved in that documenting uh, Indian knowledge and Indian medical knowledge. And this is a very important and valuable work for anyone who is interested in the subject. Next, I want to introduce you to um, a book by J. F. Royal. Royal was actually um, also a physician, but he was also interested in, in the, he was also interested in the, in the agricultural and uh, other aspects of indigenous types of plants. So the purpose of this work, he says, but for showing the immense resources of British India, both as regards whatever is necessary for agriculture, manufacturing, and, and internal trade of food. So his intentions were recording for broader, but he goes on to say, again, something happened. Much attention has been paid to the material medical of India, as this form a principal object of the author studies. So this is another very important document for those of us who are interested in individual medicine plants and in European records. Okay. Lastly, uh, I want to uh, also refer to you the work by Edward Waring, uh, who's also a physician and a pharmacist. And he said that to render the work more interesting to the medical profession, the empirical estimation of the drugs is being compared with the information obtained, obtained from modern pharmacology. So he is trying to relate the properties of medicine plants in these books to what was available at the end of the 19th century pharmacology, which is also very valuable information. The book was considered to be important enough that the work was actually almost shortly after translated into Tamil and later in the Malayalam under the sponsorship of the town of Burmaira. So, uh, so later on, of course, this continues and uh, uh, of this uh, Bengal Pharmacopoeia and was, uh, was, was published by the British in 1884, incorporating medicinal plants in India. And uh, Stuart Anderson, who has actually looked at this whole issue very carefully, says that 50% of the drugs in the official book Pharmacopoeia, 1898 and 1914, were indigenous in India on Sudan. And this is, of course, a summary uh, towards the end of this talk to show that, to remind you, that 25% of the drugs used in modern medicine contain bioactive compounds derived from or modern doctor natural products, which, of course, all of you here know. And to uh, remind all of us that plant extracts are a unique alternative therapeutic strategy to otherwise intractable diseases. And of course, we all know that there are certain types of um, um, medicines that are that were actually not only identified and then synthesized, but some of them are still being only made plants because the form the individual molecules are so complex that they cannot be synthesized. So natural compounds for which innocuous long-term use in human populations have already been documented might be a more tolerable and acceptable way you know, for disease prevention. And this is, of course, from 2012 from PNAS, which was following a paper on malaria. And lastly, I want to leave you with this one image. And while I was um, uh, looking at um, um, some work on on uh, um, um, for some medicines. I came across 
the information about supplement. Supplement he then referred me to the information about Rastam Vartikar, who was the last person, who, um, who was the only person I think who did an Alaska award, which is a prestigious American medical prize, which is considered to be the American Nobel Prize. The Oscar Award was given to Rustam Bakhtin, 1954, for studies on the use of research people in the treatment of hypertension. And so the Oscar Committee goes on to say, and the quote is a quote from the Oscar Committee at the award ceremony, says that this drug has been used in ancient Ayurvedic medicine of in India. Actually, it's also very popular in use in folk medicine. In fact, you, you know, the name Safagendi you have actually the folk medical game of the Serbia of, of Serbia. So this drug has been used in ancient Ayurvedic medicine in India for hundreds of years and has been the subject of modern scientific research in India since at least 1931. Yet innumerable fruitless leaves were being followed by Western medicine. This important one was overlooked until attention was finally focused on it by Dr. Vakil. So Dr. Vakil was given the, the Alaska Award for his discovery. What is important, so on the left here, under the image of Dr. Bhatti, I have the picture of the um, Sarbhamyanti from Portis Malabaritis. It is Chavanna Amalapur, which is a plant that is you know, available in Malabar. So, so uh, but this study actually is very important because the discovery of the Sarbhamyanti didn't stop with hypertension. In fact, the surfing as well as chlorocromosin was actually together used to form to decipher a very important neuropathics. So the surfing is not only used as a as a um, hypertension medication, but the tranquilizing properties of the surfing, and therefore its related neural activity was very important for the study of the development of some and of neuropathics. Of course, the other uh, interesting part of the story is uh, that um, in, um, the surfing, the scientific name is um, Robert yeah, was actually a German first German physician who happened to come to India in the 18th century. And and then studied Bengal medicine, but of course there is Serpentina, which somehow refers to serpent and, and suffer. So we did get a little point there. So this is my final slide, I think, <laughs> for something that we all know very much about. So I don't need to repeat it. But with rapid loss of regional medical practitioners and folk medical knowledge, the European books on Indian regional therapies, valuable resources to be visited by the company the scientific methods. And I'm very much interested in it. And I would like to uh, you know, work with, support, supply information to any of you who are interested in this because I have a vast library of this material. And lastly, I'm just showing you uh, the a page uh, from the Hortus Malavaricus that shows the handwritten testimony of Kitty Achinen, here of physician, who was supposed to be the primary um, scholar who supplied information for the tall volume at Malabaricus. And on the right, the chicken of C very well is actually in Malayalam quality script. And indeed, he has written it. So, so I just wanted to introduce you to these British works. And as I showed you in that slide, there are there are large numbers of British works. And I've just chose the three that I uh, highlighted because they are because of their accessibility, their specificity, and the information provided in those books, I found very useful. And I also recommend the main papers on the conceptual transactions of our society because they are also very well. Mm -hmm. So thank you, and that I hope that I uh, told you something you didn't know, yeah. and that I inspired somebody, and that I would be very interested to. Do whatever I can to help make this work. So much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am, for the good mind blowing presentation. You have taken us from um, 1563 and uh, explained us about the entire history. And also, you have highlighted that uh, source of, sources of Indian tradition, medical knowledge, 
has been sometimes not identified and also credited. And the British part, the Portuguese part, the Dutch part, very clearly you have explained. And uh, I'm sure it's very, very useful for us. And now we have some time for questions. Um, anyone could raise the hands from uh, online and both uh, offline. We can uh, have questions on that. The first question, I think Dr. Punyamurthy has asked that, why at that time the classical traditions were not documented and folk was been documented? That's one question Dr. Punyamurthy is asking. So one of the one of the I mean it's there is no place where you can actually find an answer to that. So you can extrapolate you can actually, except in Garcia Hort. In 1566, when Garcia Hort has published his first work on Indian medicine, the European first European work on Indian medicine, he states in the work that actually scholar physicians of, of, of Goa are not actually needed to participate. So most of the knowledge was actually accessed from, he says, from Vaidyas, from Hakims, and various other physicians who were working around the world. So whether or not this was a scholarly decision by the scholar physicians, or it was that they were more, they were less accessible, it's hard for me to know. And also for the purposes of, uh, you know, for administering the medicines and so on, maybe single principle points and their, and their formulations were much more accessible to the Europeans. Do you think it might also be due to social uh, pictures and norms? Because scholar physicians, maybe they're Sanskritized Brahmins who didn't want to become impure. By well, I didn't want to say that because I thought that might be not appropriate to say. My own experience is that. When I was first starting to um, get in study, huh. uh, well, to, I did spend the first um, five, six years of my, uh, after I left the laboratory, I actually went to Kerala to spend time um, between high school and two. Um, I studied with actually two of the major scholar physicians of Kerala, who I should say was very kind to me and actually put me into becoming a quasi disciple. And, but early on, when I first went to visit this gentleman, his question was, what, what do you want? And of course, I attributed it to my somewhat foreign appearance of my short hair and so on. But I think he was not as receptive. But once I knew he understood my intention was scholarly and not otherwise, he has actually become a mentor. And in fact, one of the books I published, he actually, I thanked him, in fact, I dedicated it. So that is probably part of the part of the uh, because you know they were at a socially at a very different level. Yes. Can I ask? Uh, I have two questions. Okay. Uh, first thing is that uh, in one of the slides you said like the British physicians and surgeons learned medical uh, applications of local flora from uh, uh, Indian things. So, what was their form superior uh, in the Indian uh, medical system at that time? Because now we feel that like the uh, Western medical system is sort of you know superior, but at that time they were trying to learn that from uh, Indian. Uh... But when they first came to India, as I showed in that quote, they find that Galenic medicine does not work here, okay? Because tropical diseases were something that they were not familiar with. This was also their experience in the Americas, because you know that the story of quinine. They go to the Americas and and people are dying by you know, by the thousands. And so they find that the there is a, this magical bark for the you know which uh, can cure this febrile disease, and so the Jesuits take this bark and bring it to Italy, where of course malaria was rampant, and therefore quinine initially in its crude form was actually thought the name was Jesuit bark because it was taken by the Jesuits. So. The real reason, the beginning, of course, indigenous medicine was superior in their rights because tropical medicine, tropical diseases were not, you know, susceptible to Galenic medicines. Okay. And the second question, uh, after that, like say, for example, the 1700 or maybe 1800, there was a rapid progress in terms of molecular understanding and yes. isolation of compounds, etc., etc., yes. particularly in Western. Yes. Why we, I mean, like, you now India was not able to, you know, take that path, and why we were not, uh, you know, coming with that that speed of molecular understanding of this substance? Well, that is a very complicated question, and I think that's something we can talk about. You know, part of it is, of course, the dominance of the British system, 
and you know, along with you know, why is it okay? Let me ask you and ask you a question. You know, India was one of the one of the most important manufacturers, and 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 uh, and uh, cotton was one of the most important items uh, exported from India for centuries. Once the Lancaster mills were established, you know, cottons were being brought to. India. So there, that's a very complex sociological, um, sociological as well as you know industrial, all these kind of questions, right? Political also. Yes, it's a political. It's actually yes, and of course there was a, there was a point at which there was there was actual suppression of Indian medicines because it was considered to be you know based in uh, in uh, superstitions and so on. But, <laughs> Let me just give you one example. There's a quote in the Rig Veda that I actually have on my computer, which talks about the healer, the paisage. Okay? He is on he is uh, the plague, plague dispeller and the demon killer. This is a translation uh, by kind of name. But the fact that a particular plant can actually alter the state of your mind such that you can dispel demons, meaning psychological or other manifestations, okay, is something that is now accepted. But initially, the fact that we, an individual physician could actually uh, do uh, a therapy, a treatment, including a ritual, as well as a, a medicine, and change the altered state of mind was considered to be, you know, Focus, focus. Mm -hmm. So there is some of that sort of, you know, uh, colonial, you know, uh, colonized interaction also going on here. But the other thing in all fairness is also to do with the discovery of you know, instrumentation microscopy. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Leuvenhoff's microscope, for the first time you were able to see small creatures. And of course, John Donald Ross, was a physician in India actually shows that malaria was transmitted by uh, mosquitoes and there were little organisms involved. So that sort of thing, of course, gives you know Western medicine a, gave Western medicine a tremendous you know advantage. Yes. Yeah. Somehow, uh, in the context of uh, uh, translation of the text of Ayurveda or any traditional medicine. I partially agree with you that the scholars were may not be you know not ready to open up with the uh, British scholars of those days. Yes. However, uh, the uh, books of the, the texts of Ayurveda were translated to Persian language and to Tibetan. Yes. Yes. So, however, not translated to European languages, to so, my knowledge. But so that's is, quite surprised. Yes. That's an interesting yeah. question, but you see. Yeah. Um, the Persian languages, I mean, I don't know the level of the interaction yeah. where they, uh, the interaction between uh, those people more scholarly, more equal. You know, because many of the documents that were exchanged between, you know, surrounding nations nearby were on a very different basis. It was not a dominant, dominated, dominant interaction. Yeah. That may have had something. To Probably do. they came as the learners, and you know. Yes, they came to yeah. learn. Yeah. I mean, in the same way that you know Chinese scholars came yes. to India and took Buddhist texts, learned, copied the Buddhist texts, and took them to China or to other parts of Eastern, you know, or Asia. The interaction was very different. It was learning. It was cooperation. It was uh, it was mutual respect. That may have had something. But, but on the contrary, sorry, to do with the religion or the, I mean belief or religion. So yes, of course, Thailand. Yeah, it's a very. I mean, you know, that whole part is very complicated because yes, there is. Yeah. There is uh, you know. Yeah. I will take a question from uh, online. Uh, did one more question, one minute. I'll just take one question from the uh, 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 people. Did many of these plants make it into European? Apotheceries, in addition to the spices already being traded. Salama has asked this question. 
So is there some of these plants taken to Europe? Yeah, is it been? Do many of these plants oh, make spice. it into the European apothecaries in addition to the spices already being traded? Yes, many, many, many medicines are taken. In fact, yeah. I, as I was saying, that Acosta's work, the second work book in that list that I showed you, was published in uh, Spain in Spanish for the use of um, Spanish physicians and apothecaries using Indian medicines. So yeah. in the same way as I was also you know, yeah, if you look at some of the Portuguese literature, Portuguese correspondence from, from the you know, Estado India, you can see that large shipments of medicines were actually taken from India to not only to all, all other colonial enterprises, but also in, to use in European hospitals. One more question they have asked. Major part of botanical collection and documentation during the colonial period was done by groups of European naturalists, physicians, and botanists under Danish Halley mission. Why there is not mention about these those contributions of Benjamin Connell, John Gerard Cohen? Oh, John Gerard was the British British uh, apothecary, and John Gerard actually never came to India. John Gerard was a herbalist. Uh, I actually have, happened to have a facsimile copy of John Gerard's work. John Gerard had never been to India, but he did collect information from uh, from um, other in, information about Indian medicine plants. In fact, Gerard's book lists 200 plants of Indian origin, which have medicine properties. But he was never in the India. Those books document some Indian medical information but they're not exclusively on Indian medicine. So now I miss the other name. Yeah, and Christopher Samuel John, John Peter Rotel, and uh, Carl Solder and Jacob Killin. These names are already... It was not my intention to uh, talk about every uh, British publication or European publication because I would be here until tomorrow morning. As I showed you the list <laughs> in the slide, a large number of works were published. I selected some for reasons that I thought would be of interest to you. Uh, and so I did not meant this to be a comprehensive record of all British documents on Indian medicine. Yeah. That is and not. Amoga, yeah, Amoga has asked one more broad question saying that what are the scope of Indian traditional medicine in the US? It's a quite broad question, yeah. <laughs> Well, Indian traditional medicine, I mean, it, it depends upon how you define Indian traditional medicine. Um, there is, of course, a great deal of interest. And in fact, I was going to show you a slide just as sort of an aside for fun. But then I thought it would be it would take away from the more scholarly nature of the talk. But I have, I have it on my cell phone. If you want, I can show you. I was in the pharmacy in, in my home, in where I live in Palo Alto, and there was a whole shelf of over-the-counter medicine over the counter uh, selling tumoral, extract from turmeric plant as a cure for a number of conditions, over the counter medicine. So there is a, you can buy ashwagandha extract. And so if you look at, but then of course there is, you know, there are bona fide high by the practitioners in India and or in the US. So there are different levels of traditional medicine, medicine derived practices. In the US. Yes. Any questions there? Yeah. I'm sorry, I have posted a question. Yeah. yeah. Did you see that? Uh, you have posted, right? Yeah. The top. Uh, well, you have uh, thanked a lot. Mostly you have thanked a lot. You can no, you can ask doctor. You can ask doctor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a um uh, you have said that. Uh, the uh, Britishers and uh, Portuguese, uh, the uh, Europeans and Portuguese have taken our medicine, uh, our medicine for their personal purpose. Still, it is going on. Still, we are presenting all these things, but still, these things are going on. We are not properly recognizing that uh, the traditional medicine, okay, or the knowledge holders. What is your view? Um, I mean, are you think that they are? they're taking advantage of our medical information. Yeah, they are taking, yeah, uh, uh, earlier they are taking, but now our people are also taking them and uh, they are not at all properly recognized. 
Still, I think, I think it's, it's our responsibility to ask for recognition, and that's why I think that that I said still, that. Just still, like you said, know. Most of the modern medicine are uh, uh, modern medicine comes from these leads, Satanov medicinal leads. But we are not, but, but we are sidelining them. Just remember that today's modern is tomorrow's traditional. So we have to recognize all these things. Okay, I am uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, saying it in a holistic way. Okay, not uh, in a narrow view. That's all. I certainly agree that Indian Indian traditions have certainly had a huge impact on Western wellness. You know, the, the whole idea of, of meditation, the whole idea of yoga, and the, that, that there is a component to mind-body medicine, that mind is an important part of wellness. All of these are certainly concepts that have Asian origins. And it's not necessarily only Indian, but they are certainly concepts that have Asian origins. And I think that is highly recognized. Yeah, one more. We'll take a last question. Anything from there? Yeah, I have. I just. Yeah, please. Yeah, please. First, thank you. You inspired me 13 years ago. Of course. Uh, by holding the conference in NCBS yes. and then BS on the speaker. Uh, and that's the reason maybe I'm here. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm here. But I recognized you. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, uh, and the question I have for you is that. Uh, now when I see that there is so much about formulation that it's not just the botanical, it's the process and all that. Yes. Do you think that was deliberately kept aside by the bot maybe the botanist or the scholar who wrote this books or they didn't, as you said, they didn't have access or but access means it was available everywhere. But the form only the botanicals, the plants were given the most importance. And the well, actually, if you look, if you look at the the one that I showed you from from oh, yeah. the philosophical transaction, yeah. it talks about the fact that it is made and extracted with butter. Yeah, and, yeah. and yeah. yeah, there are others who say it has to be it's a decoction. So there are in there is information on preparation, but how extensive it is, you know, that you would have to really look at more closely. But in the method of preparation, at least in the papers on the philosophical transactions, they do give method of preparation. In fact, they talk about, if you notice, time of collection, because it says it was collected between February this and this date. So that I find very interesting because as a plant, as a biologist, you know that the time of the season and the time of collection of all these are very important for the small molecules in plants. So I think that's one of the reasons why I found the philosophical transaction paper interesting because I thought it had more scientific detail. Have you ever come across with any unpublished data while searching about the history? Because these all the things what you are speaking about the published data in the like as a historical perspective. Any un, is there any chance of unpublished data like just like yes, I spent quite a bit of time at the National Natural Museum National History Museum in London. I, in, in my younger days. <laughs> there are documents in the Natural History Museum uh, which are British documents which have never been published. In addition, that is something my interest uh, uh, is that there's a very, very, the image that I, what image that I showed you where a British or, or a European is sitting on a chair and there are uh, others surrounding him, including a scholar physician, or maybe a Vaidya and other people. That is taken from a document called the Garden of Orissa. Jardin Flourish or something like that. I can't say French. But it is a document put together uh, over a period of 30 years by a French physician. It's in the Natural History Museum in Paris. And I have actually seen it. It is illustrated. It is actually modeled after the Ortus malabaricus, but it is on the medicinal plants of Orisa. That work has never been translated. And, and this waiting to be translated. Yeah, this this what exactly we have got the entire manuscript with us. We have in our, with us in, and they have given us now uh, to translate this from French to English. They okay. are agreeing to okay. uh, come forward this, yes. and we are trying to work out with them and see that uh, how we can really. Translate this entire Orissa uh, uh, items to English. We are working on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah because because that book was actually yeah first yeah. brought in notice by Kapil Raj, 
Yes. And then yes, and then at a meeting in Hyderabad, yeah, uh, the the actual disc of that uh, was presented to yes, in, yes, yes, that, same thing. That copy we got now, it's there online. We are trying to uh, talk with the museum head in such a way that can be work out like translating this into English and Oriya language. We are trying to work on it. Let's see what they are saying. We have written to them. We are for, waiting for their response. Yeah. For, for more for more such documents, I suggest the the Natural History Museum in London. Yeah. There are documents that have never been printed, mm -hmm. but they are in English and they don't need to be translated. Yeah. But yeah. there are lesser works by um, British physicians. Uh, which were not published. Correct. What about the Welcome Trust collection? That also is, does it also have some stuff? I can the Welcome Trust collection. There is Welcome. I don't know if the Welcome has unpublished work. Yeah, they do. They have okay. a vault full of stuff. Okay. Uh, but uh, I mean, and they dig out stuff from there depending on how the uh, they want to curate their museum. But that's just, I never thought about it. But they have. Uh, because Henry Welcome was a very prodigious collector. Yes, he didn't collect yes, anything. Yes, he was a prodigious yeah. collector. Yeah. In fact, one of the images that did, I didn't show was an image from the British Welcome Library that showed a surgical procedure oh. that was and that was actually done in India that the British recorded that they, they, they had never seen a rhinoplasty. Ah, right. Yes. Yeah, that that image is in, image is in the, book, in the yeah. Welcome Library. I think it's getting time. Uh, Dashanji, do you uh, like to sir, sir, say something? One second, one second, one second, one second. <laughs> Just to say hi yeah. to Dashan Sangha, sir, <laughs> after a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Dashanji, do you like to say something? Yeah. Let's make a comment towards yeah. him uh, asked the question. There's a French uh, scholar, F.O., I don't know how to pronounce it. The emperor, somebody. Who says that the first translations mm. of Ayurvedic literature in the West were probably made by Greeks? So the numeral theory, yes. according to this French person, may actually be a translation of the Osha. So it's not that uh, no translation, but of course that. Not enough scholarship has been done. This French man says that he thinks, I have seen in the Borough Welcome Library in London an entire book uh, in English trans translation, but a book which says a big book, you know, like maybe 150 pages, mm -hmm. on the theory of the breath, mm -hmm. the breath. Mm -hmm. I would have thought, you know, looking at it, it is Vat Vichar. But it's a, it's a Greek uh, literature. So a lot of Greek literature, if someone does scholarship, might find that the earliest translation, the translations into Arabic, translations into Persian, took place much later. And even Galen, what he promoted was the Greek humoral theory into the Middle East. Yes. So he brought the human theory into the Middle East far earlier than uh, the later actual translations, which you can see in a library. There's a excellent re references by this Seema Alavi. Mm -hmm. He was there at that uh, that he's talking about. Seema has written about Islamic healing yes. and something. Yes. But her second chapter has very, very good references to the relationship between uh, the Arabic and the Persian traditions and Ayurveda directly from uh, primary sources, et cetera, et cetera. So it has been, but uh, starting the Greek, more oh, recently, yes, there has not been. And uh, the question of, you know, just a comment, I think, it is much easier for the user to look at the formulation that's working than to try and figure out the principles behind it and, and the, you know, the logic behind it. And so no one bothered about profoundness of, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's what we are all familiar with, you know, with the uh, Rosh Vichar and this and that and all that. It's theoretical foundation, but 
never explored. You are only looking directly at the application end. It's much easier. The plant, single plants, easier than complex, the actual formulation, the actual use. So no one went into the depth to see the theoretical. Still, even today, in India itself, people well on abroad, uh, we don't find this exchange happening between you have the very person whom she interviewed, the family, Vaidya Madam. I first met him in 1986, and you know, he narrated to me an actual work that he did on regenerative biology, where he had uh, transformed a person of 50 years old, not 100 years ago, but this century. This is a narration of 1986, you know, where at the end of 90 day treatment, the skeletal tissues had transformed. The hair fell down, new hair came, teeth fell down, new teeth came. To a person at that age, 50s, he narrated similarly about a leprosy patient who recovered. You know, you just... You have no interaction between modern stem cell biology and Rasayan Tantra, which is the name we have for regenerative biology. And the goal is the same, to regenerate cell, tissue, organ, the whole body. Even today, there is zero interaction. So, yeah. I think yeah. that's one of the really losses of the system, of the issue, yes. But the works don't even mention the words Vata, Pitta, Kapha, or where? In, no, that, no. in these uh, document, uh, documents. But see, that, uh, these that becomes complex. Oh, because now, what is one? I mean, you will find it in Asia. Yes. You will find it in Chinese mm -hmm. equivalents. You will find it in Pali. You will find it in, uh, in Thai. Because here, the culture in Japan, you will find it. So, you know, here there was a cultural uh, thing also. There, Vata, Pitta, Kapha, not there, even now here. Yes. The best modern scientific yes. institution. Yes, yes. Talking of Kapha, Vata, Pitta, we don't know what this means. Not even a word of fundamental. Yeah. Yes. But, but, you know, to, to comment on what you said, that these books don't mention Vata, Pitta, one reason is that these people, these people who recorded, did these recordings are not scholars. Their major, their major goal was to find cures mm -hmm. for people, for British soldiers, and uh, you know, and and. Yes, in the so they were not really scholars. They were physicians who were sent here by the British East India Company to cure people and keep them healthy. So they had no scholarly interest in, in, in reality, and this is why the Petiver comes in. You know, so James. Um, Brown is, I mean, Samuel Brown is sending the material to Pettiver, and Pettiver is some, trying to put some scholarly interpretations on what he's sending by referring it to other existing tests and so on. Yes, I think by that time, you know, Europeans started to look at the molecules rather than, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, because spinin was discovered by that time. And in fresh notes. So. Yes, exactly. That's, uh, that's maybe the reason. I think it is getting late. We can uh, conclude the session. Uh, so I thank uh, ma'am for really presenting us and many people are really, and many other questions, there are still few questions I'll directly pass on to you later uh, because it is getting time. And uh, thank you very much ma'am for uh, spending your time and uh, uh, when's the moment when I wrote you agreed and you said yes, I will, I'm in India, immediately I'll come to TDU and give a presentation. This will be very relevant to all, all of you. That sort of words that you have written in your mail, really, uh, we are very happy that uh, you have spent your time and you have come here and uh, enlightened us with different uh, things now to think. Our mind will start thinking on different issues and we'll start working on it. Uh, thank you very much. And I thank all the participants who have uh, been both, both online and offline. Be in touch. We'll be having similar webinars like this on different, different themes, uh, which will be really enlightening. Thank you very much. So we'll end the session. Thanks.